Welcome to the Paul Garchess University. In this lesson, our topic will be Space Advantage and how to increase it and eventually how to transform it to other sorts of advantages and eventually, of course, to material gain and winning the game. The game we'll look at is a consultation game, the white team led by Tarash, black team by Mrs. Let's see how the game started. D4, D5, C4, C6, very common starting moves of the Slav defense, knight F6. Today is one of most popular openings, although we have to say that they were ahead of their times as this game was played in 1888. And came bishop g5, a rare move today. Most often white would play e3 and transfer to a Meran or play knight f3 allowing the Slav with dc4. But in this game we'll look at this rare but interesting move, bishop to g5. When black certainly didn't react the best way by playing e6 and simply giving white the opportunity to transfer to some Queen's Gambit type of position. Here probably the best move would be to play e3 right now, no longer allowing for black the famous Gambit variations which can happen after knight f3 which was white's choice of course right now black could either capture on c4 right away and get into the famous Botvinnik variation or play the today extremely popular h6 and then capturing on c4 which is the Moscow variation and the game is usually extremely wild after white plays e4 and black plays b5 and so on leading to an absolutely wild and crazy game. But right now we're not looking at that part of the game or opening. We'll look at the game after black played bishop to d6. Well, this square may look like a good idea for the bishop as it controls a central square on e5 however the problem is that white's bishop already created a pin on the knight on f6 and therefore it's healthier to put that bishop on e7 uh, bishop e7 would be a normal move of course also playing knight d7 is quite normal and uh, that would be the famous Cambridge spring variation if then black would follow it up with queen a5 in trying to pin white's knight real quick also with the bishop afterwards. So let's go back to the game where black continued here with bishop d6 and white played solidly with e3 black castled and came bishop d3 developing knight bd7 and white castled. So far things are pretty normal although black hasn't developed in an ideal way. And came rook e8 and queen c2. So from here on the game is very interesting from our perspective as of space advantage. White has space advantage because the pawn is on c4 versus black's pawn being in his own territory only on the third rank on c6. It is quite interesting in chess how when pieces are on the wrong places and for the other side they are on the right places all of a sudden tactics appear kind of seemingly out of nowhere. But since it happens all the time, I think there is some kind of fairness in it or some kind of reality in it. So right now, White, with his last move, created a serious threat in grabbing the pawn on h7. Probably Black's best option right now is to play knight f8 to defend against that. 
It's always a bit scary to play g6 in such positions, weakening the dark squares in view of white's bishop being right around there. The drawback of playing h6 in such situations can be that later one day, of course right now moving the bishop out of the way from g5, but later some day the white bishop and queen may change places and then may create a dangerous attack on the h7 square. But of course that would be sometime in the future, nevertheless it's something for black to be aware of. Black right now played queen c7 trying to get out of the pin which of course also defends against the threat of bishop captures h7. However the queens rarely well placed on the c-file in the queen's gambit. Why? Because very often the white rook appears there on c1 and then it will be uh, in all kind of pins that will be unpleasant. However, in this very case, the reason why it's not a good move is different. It is that it takes away the c7 square from black's bishop. And white immediately took advantage of that by playing c5. So now the black bishop needs to retreat and get away from its ideal diagonal b8h2 that at least looks towards white's king. So the black bishop returned to e7 and white played bishop f4. Another important element that's going on typically in such positions is to make sure that black doesn't get to play e5 because that would certainly clearly activate black's position. The poor black queen had to go back to its initial square. We can see how now white has a serious lead in development, space advantage and activity. White played b4, black played knight f8 protecting the pawn on h7 and now a simple preventive move, white plays h3. A very typical move worth remembering with the idea that if the black knight goes to h5 the bishop can hide simply on h2. One interesting thing about bishops is that oftentimes a bishop, like in this case from h2, is just as powerful almost as it would be on f4 because the bishop is a long-range piece and it can do most of the things it would want to do just as well from further back, in this case h2. So let's go back to the game and see how black continued. White's plan right now is to simply advance further on the queen's side, play b5 and open a file or sometimes two for the rooks and for example after an exchange of pawns on c6 all of a sudden the c6 pawn could become a target of attack. Black played bishop d7, a pretty sad position for black, I have to say. In fact, if you look at the position after, uh, here we are, after h3, you will see that the black pieces hardly have any moves. There are in fact only six possible moves for black which don't lose material. That's pretty scary. If you compare to white's options, white has 33 such moves. So this is a perfect example when one side is more active and has space advantage. So after bishop d7, white was ready to play b5. Of course it's worth mentioning that if black would want to prevent the b5 for a moment, it would be very temporary as white would play a4 and the b5 would arrive in any case. Okay, so bishop d7, b5, and black played queen c8. White follows up with a typical move for such positions a4. The idea is clear. White wants to play a5 next, followed by a6, and with that attack the base of the pawn chain. 
As we know, generally, always the base of a pawn chain is the weakest because the base cannot be supported by another pawn. Pawns which can be protected by a pawn usually are never in any danger because even if, let's say, five, six enemy pieces all target up against a pawn that's protected by another pawn, they are still in no danger. However, when the base is being attacked, then only if equal number of pieces protect the attacked pawn is sufficient. So after a4, black played knight h5, but now we already know the response to that. Simply hide the bishop on h2. Now the knight on h5 is out of the game. Black played bishop d8, and white simply follows up the plan with a5. If right now white would take on b5, the knight would capture back with a very dangerous threat of knight d6 next. And if bishop takes, bishop takes. Now if the rook moves, the rook gets trapped right away. Or if the knight blocks, then c6 leads to serious trouble for black because, for example, after takes, takes, black's rook in the corner is in trouble. So let's go back again. After a5, black in the game responded by trying to exchange bishops, which generally is certainly a good idea when you're in a cramped position. White accepted that challenge. Queen c7 and finally a6, the move we wanted to make all this time, which undermines the base of black's pawn structure b7 through d5. If right now the pawn would capture on a6, white of course would capture on c6, and after that captured on a6 with the rook, which results in two great things for white. One is that white created a protected passed pawn on c5, and the other one that black created himself a weakness, a target in the isolated a7 pawn. White would double up the rooks on the a-file and then triple up with the queen also assisting on the attack on the pawn. White's advantage would be quite obvious. Let's go back again. After a6, the game continued differently by black playing b6. And now again it's the moment when tactics appear kind of out of nowhere, but not really. You can see the black queen on an unprotected square, you can see black's knight out of the game on h5, and you can see that white has space advantage. Usually when there is more than one problem with the position of one side, it invites some possibilities of tactics. So right now white continued by first capturing on c6. Now here are, here are some little tactics. If the queen captures on c6, then knight comes with a tempo, queen moves away, knight captures the bishops, and black is in trouble. If knight captures, the pawn on h7 will be lost, or if the queen captures, then skewer with the bishop. Let's go back again. Here we go. After bc6, instead of the queen in the actual game, black captured with the bishop. And white traded the second pair of pawns, opening all the files. And again, black is in trouble. If the pawn captures back, in addition to creating white, a dangerous pass pawn on a6, white has immediate tactics to immediately win material. After knight b5, which uses the pin, the bishop cannot capture, the queen has no good place to go to, because if it goes to d7, there is a fork coming with knight e5, or if the queen goes to c8, the fork arrives with knight d6. So in either case, white is winning. Therefore, in the game, black chose to capture back with the queen. 
and this gives White another tempo in getting his kingside rook to the queen side. If queen c7 now, again knight b5, just like we saw, and then black will be forced to get into one of the forks or discoveries. Queen moved back to d8. And moving forward constantly, and at this point not leaving black time to recover. Right now the bishop needs to move, as if either the rook or the queen protects, then knight captures, let's say rook recaptures, and bishop b5. The idea we're already familiar with. So therefore, bishop moved back to d7, knight captured, and again the same problem as we've seen in an earlier variation that if queen takes bishop b5 or if knight takes as black did in the game then comes bishop h7 so now white is a pawn up already but let's see the technique that led to a win black played king h8 and the very important in such situations when you just grab the pawn on h7 not to wait until your opponent locks up the way back of the bishop. You'd want to retreat the bishop while you can. And that's exactly what white did. And black played knight b6. Trying to close up the b file and the entry of white's rook to b7. Of course, white doesn't accept that so easily and therefore immediately offers an exchange of knights to open up the b-file and as we know generally speaking it's a good idea to trade pieces when we're up material and white is up a pawn at this moment knight took queen took back so now the road for the white rook to b7 is clear black played rook e7 and nevertheless rook b7 Capturing on b7 right now would just lead to more trouble as the pawn would capture back and then when the black rook moves the a7 pawn will be lost. So black therefore moved rook to c8 and white simply doubles up came rook c7. And now white has number of ways to play of course in a position like this there is more than one good way. Uh, let's see an additional way that was good which white did not play. White could have traded right now with the idea that if queen takes then rook b7 comes let's say queen c1 king h2 and if now for example queen d2 then all of a sudden white has some cute tactical opportunities by playing queen d7, attacking the rook, and after rook f8, queen f7. That's really cute, using the back rank problem that black has. Nice little variation. Let's go back. After rook c7, if after a trade black captures back with the rook, then white could play queen b4 with the idea to then trade queens when black prevents that with rook c8 then play rook queen b7 attack the pawn and after rook c7 nevertheless play queen b8 and for example queen c8 take take rook b7 and that wins another pawn so this perhaps was a bit better than what white played White instead played queen a5. Of course, it doesn't slip the win out of white's hand, just makes the game a bit longer. Now black got the moment to take care of that back rank problem, which could have caused trouble if white played a bit more energetically on the previous move. White played bishop to f1, making sure there are no trouble with some rook c1 check. By the way, if on the previous move black would have tried to win white's queen, it wouldn't really have worked because white would just trade rooks and then after king h2 the queen cannot be taken again because of the back rank problem that black has. So now we can understand even a bit better 
why black played g6 right now. So now the king has, of course, two escape squares, no more back rank checkmate in the picture. So white played bishop f1, preventing the rook c1 check. Finally, the knight came back to the game, and white was ready to trade. Trade, 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 and rook b7. If black doesn't want to lose further pawns, has no choice but to trade, but this makes white's pawn even more dangerous. Forcing knight d7, bishop b5, knight b8. So now white is in a completely winning position, of course only if you know the game plan. The game plan is that the white king simply wants to get somewhere around c7 and attack that knight and then capture it. Now, the only piece that can try to prevent that on the black side is black's king. Black's problem is that once the black king goes all the way to the queen side, white has a potential to create a passed pawn on the h-file. And then black will simply be in a situation that the king will not be able to cover both problems, the running of the h-pawn and the entrance of white's king to c7 and the queen side. So let's see how the game proceeded. Came h4, black responded with king g7, g4, king f6, and f4. White is in no rush. King e7, king f2, king d8, king e2. And now, of course, the black king cannot go after white's pawn because then the h5 pawn just runs away and is unstoppable. So black was forced to just sit and wait, so to say. Play king e7, king d3, king d6, king c3, f6, king b4. And we can see already the future. If black moves the king, then the white king enters on c5, and then the h-pawn will force the black king to go towards that part of the board, allowing the white king to march in and grab the black knight. So black here played e5. Of course, this does not improve on the situation. White just traded, traded, and the king got in anyway. King e6, h5. And here black resigned because, for example, if takes, takes, King e5, white would just play h6, and when the king goes that way, then the white king gets in and wins. A very nice strategical game by Tarash and his team. And finally, let's see the jewel of the week. Here we go. This endgame has been composed by Nadareshvili, and in fact this is just the final part of the endgame, which is pretty impressive on its own. Black is up a rook and a knight, and the only hope that white has is the pawn on g7. But how can white save this game despite this tremendous material disadvantage? Try to find a solution on your own before you listen to the correct answer. And the correct answer is playing bishop to d3. Well, it was important to notice that the white king is in a stalemate situation, so white doesn't mind getting rid of his last mobile piece, the bishop. So if rook would take bishop, it's stalemate. Otherwise, in the meantime, white is threatening to checkmate, actually, and win the game. Black cannot just move the bishop away, clearing the f7 square for its king, because then white will win after promoting the pawn. So after bishop d3, black can try a tricky move, bishop g6. It is tricky because if the white king captures, then already the king is no longer in a stalemate situation, and therefore the black rook can capture white's bishop, and the material advantage will prevail. On the other hand, if white captures the bishop with his bishop, maintaining the threat of bishop h7, then black is winning after pinning the bishop. And after king h5, 
black can choose to immediately capture the pawn or even better give a check and then capture the bishop as well okay so this didn't quite work out as white hoped so after bishop g6 the correct move right now is to check forcing black's bishop back and then just come back to d3 well there was one more cute thing here going on black can play knight g5 and guard the h7 square of course now white is not capturing the knight because then after rook takes bishop black is easily winning however plays the elegant bishop h7 check forcing knight takes and voila stalemate hope you enjoyed this beautiful jewel of the week and of course the very instructive positional game that we saw how to increase the advantage when you have space advantage thank you for listening and come back next week for some more chess ideas bye bye mm -hmm.